Hey kids, do you like history? Yeah. Do you like stories about World War II? Yeah. Do you like alternate history stories about World War II? Then avoid this book series with your life. It'll kill your passion just as it has killed mine. Harry Turtledove is a pioneer of alternate history. His books throughout the 80s to 90s created a genre that inspired many to go on and create their own stories, and is still considered the king of alternate history. Such stories like the South winning the Civil War because South Africans traveled back in time and gave the Confederates AK-47s. <laughs> Maybe aliens randomly invaded during World War II. Or perhaps Joseph Stalin was born in the United States and became a dictator anyway. <laughs> there were some highs and there were some lows, but generally his books are at least interesting in concept. So I decided to read the War That Came Early series, a six-part saga about if World War II began a year earlier. And you know, Emperor Tiger Star and I have talked about Turtle Dove books in the past, so I thought this was going to be simple. I talk about the first half of the series, he talks about the second half, what could go wrong. Alright, so uh, let's get through this bit by bit. Before we can get into the, uh, the problems, we gotta talk about the grand history, the big stuff, the things that actually happen. The entire concept of the War That Came Early series is that a few premature decisions led to World War II beginning far quicker than anyone, even Germany, was really prepared for. We begin in 1938, as Europe is on the brink. Germany has recently annexed Austria and is in talks to take the Sudetenland from Czechoslovakia next. You know, basic 10th grade history stuff. Meanwhile, the Spanish Civil War is still ongoing. Yet, remarkably, it's won without Francisco Franco. Instead, the Spanish Nationalist leader, Jose Sanjuro, doesn't get into a plane crash and survives to continue leading the Spanish fascists in the Civil War. All you need to know is, under Sanjuro, Spain is less keen on staying neutral in the coming war. And it had its eyes on Gibraltar. So, what's the big break then? What's the Great Divergence? Simply put, it's all up to Hitler. Hey, that's the name of the show. In this alternate timeline, a Czech assassinated a nationalist leader around the same time as the diplomatic meetings. And Hitler decides to pounce on this, using it as justification for war against Czechoslovakia. In his meetings with Chamberlain, the appeasement of Germany makes him fully confident that Germany is ready to take on the British and French if need be. Therefore, he moves his invasion plans up, and the whole charade of taking land to reunite Germany falls apart. Germany is now openly aggressive against the Czechs, instead of just, you know, slipping in and accidentally taking over the nation in our own timeline, without anyone declaring war. Germany's actions this time spark a declaration of war from both Britain and France. So long story short, instead of World War II beginning with the invasion of Poland, it instead begins with the invasion of Czechoslovakia. And this has some interesting short-term ramifications. For one, Spain. Since the Spanish Civil War is now tied into the Greater War, Republican Spain survives on. The whole Civil War in a way just meanders out and results in a stalemate for the time being. Now invading Czechoslovakia does change a bit. For one, it gives the Czechs a fighting chance. And two, it allows the Czechs' neighbors to exploit the situation such as taking some land for themselves. A commonly forgot fact about pre-war Poland is how nationalistic it kinda was, and this book explores how the Poles felt more allied to Germany as a bulwark against the communist Soviets. Also, they hoped Germany would allow them to take a chunk of their neighbor. Well, what do you know? The Soviets decide to declare war on Poland. Yet this time, Poland runs to Germany for aid, there is a temporary German-Polish front forms to push back against the Soviets that are now invading Poland. And without any side really being prepared, the war kind of just grinds to a stalemate by winter. By early 1939, France and Germany are going at it, and the war on the Western Front has resulted in the French taking a few regions away from Germany. 
the French are actually going on the offensive. Yet it begins to collapse as the Germans kinda just do the same maneuver that they did in our timeline. Invade the Netherlands, sweep aside Belgium, go after Paris, and it has mixed results. If you want to think of this conflict like anything, it's World War II light. Neither side has really harnessed their industrial capability like in our timeline. Instead, they rely on outdated World War I tech and strategy, even using biplanes in some instances. While Germany is still using Panzer I's, the point is World War II doesn't begin with a bang. Instead, it's just sort of meandering. This alternate scenario follows a few of the events that we saw in our own history, but Germany doesn't have the immediate advantage that it did. Germany knows this too, and the war struggle causes political instability in the Reich, with a failed coup on Hitler. Despite surviving this plot, Nazi Germany still has a major problem. Because Hitler jumped the gun so soon, that year of military buildup that Germany had in our own timeline just doesn't happen. Instead, Germany finds itself split between two fronts, just like in the Great War. The book ends in the first half of 1939. The Allies were able to push back the Germans, and a new front begins to settle in. Also, the Japanese declared war on the Soviets. Book 2, West and East, West and West. Somehow, it's even longer, and less actually happens. Yeah, that's right. Book one was the more eventful one. You know, maybe it, it uh, comes around. For as long as West and East is, almost 500 pages, the main change that occurs is Japan does pretty all right in their war against the Soviets, and the French push Germany back to the border. The Soviets attempt an invasion, and while that failed, it's still only a matter of time. Really, the war seems like it'll be over soon. Yeah. Yeah, you'd think so. <laughs> Alright, so as you can see, this is a six-part book series. If Germany is losing the war so early on, then how can there be six books? Aren't Britain, France, and the Soviets just about to push in on Germany? Well, aren't you in for a shock? Rudolf Hess, Deputy Fuhrer and overall dope, still gets in a plane and flies out of Germany and into Britain to convince the Allies to abandon the war and join Germany against the Soviet Union. And because conveniently Winston Churchill died in a f***ing drunk driving accident, he isn't there to stop the Allies from allying with the Nazis. <laughs> did, did everyone just decide, you know what, yeah, communism sucks. Communism is the very definition of failure. Even sending their troops into Poland to join the Nazis. And there you go, that's, that's the first half. Books one through three summed it all up. And you may be thinking, well, Cody, that doesn't sound so bad. And you know, that's fair. It sounds like a fun and wacky plot. As a brief description, not three books, 500 pages each. No. Do you know where most of our focus is spent throughout this series? The actual meat and potatoes, if you will, consists of paragraphs exactly like this. Hey sweetheart, one of the workmen called. He rocked his hips forward and back. His buddies laughed. Sarah just kept walking. They don't know we're Jews, she said in a low voice. A good thing, too. They'd be worse if they did. Her mother answered, I keep hearing they're going to make us put yellow stars on our clothes. Thank God it hasn't happened yet that's all I can say. Like the ghetto in the old days. Sarah shivered. <sighs> so, uh, now that I think about it, for all the times I've talked about a Turtle Dove book, have I ever actually talked about, you know, the characters? Because after spending all that time, I have some, uh, opinions. But you know, that's for another time. This was just a lore video. Go watch part two.